Hi, my name is Suzanne Johnson and I'm a gynaecologist from Southampton. This is a talk about ultrasound in gynaecology. There are many different uses of ultrasound in gynaecology and here I've made a little list of pathology that you can diagnose using ultrasound. How to perform a pelvic ultrasound. I'm going to talk about history, equipment, whether or not to have a full bladder, probe orientation, patient positioning, inserting the probe, image optimization, a systematic scan example with stills and videos, and some advanced scanning of the posterior compartment, how to write a report. Taking a brief history is really important rather than just accepting what's been written on the request card. Taking a brief history will give you a much shorter list of differential diagnoses and it allows you then to hunt for specific pathology. The equipment, of course, a room with a door that locks so people feel private, a changing area, a bed with lithotomy poles or a bed that breaks with a chair. That would be absolutely fine. Um, lithotomy poles make life slightly easier. Um, then you need a cover for the front of the patient, an ultrasound machine with uh, transabdominal and transvaginal probes and 3D if possible, um, probe covers without latex and of course cleaning and disinfectant materials whether or not to attend with a full bladder. Hmm. I only start a pelvic ultrasound transabdominally if the uterus is enlarged on examination or if transvaginal ultrasound is inappropriate, maybe a child or if there's no consent um, possible or if the patient declines consent, of course, for a transvaginal scan. If there are known fibroids, I'll start TA for fibroid mapping and I would ask the patient to have a comfortably full bladder, um, no more than that. But for everybody else, if they consent, of course, uh, we'll always start the scan transvaginally. This saves an enormous amount of time and allows you to spend much more time doing the pelvic scan so you will see more and come up with a, a better diagnosis. I ask the patients to empty the bladder uh, and I don't use bowel prep. If necessary, if you do your scan and you think, oh, I really wish I'd start a transabdominally here, let's say that they do have uterine fibroids, uh, you can do the TA scan after the TV scan, particularly in things like ovarian malignancy, um, or just very rarely you can ask patients uh, to come back on another day for a TA scan. Probe orientation, uh, I'm, I know that you know this, but in the transverse plane, the, the fan of sound that comes from the side of the marker goes to wherever you've put the marker. So this is how I scan, it's on the right side of the screen. Images from that side of the patient go to the left side of the screen. So it's like you're looking at them face on. Whereas um, in the longitudinal plane, um, the marker is toward the patient's face. And so the head end of the patient is displayed on the side of the marker. Um, and the other side, the, the feet end, if you like, is displayed on this side of the screen. It's exactly the same um, transvaginally. If you have the probe with the marker toward the left, then you get a right left uh, side like you do transabdominally. And transvaginally, similarly, if you have the marker at the top, um, then the head end of the patient is displayed here and the foot end is displayed there. So ultimately, if somebody has an antiverted uh, uterus, this is what it would look like. Bladder at the front, then the uterus, the vagina and the bowel um, uh, and the pouch of Douglas in between. So this is in the longitudinal plane. The uterus would look like this with the anterior wall, fundus, posterior wall, and here's the cervix. So the patient's head end and the patient's foot end in an antiverted uterus. Um, and in a transverse view, you'd have the patient's right on that side and the left on that side. So I always scan this way, uh, nice and simple. So the transvaginal scan of the pelvis needs to be done in a systematic way. And so, uh, as I said, an empty bladder. Be very, very gentle. This is the single most important thing. The more gentle you are, the better tolerated the scan, the more better you will see and the better diagnosis you will make. I have the patient's bottom overhanging the edge of the couch just a little bit and then either knee supports or feet on a chair. I never use a wedge. I just won't do it because you set yourself up to fail by using a wedge. I then say to the patient, let your knees go floppy. And this again makes a huge difference uh, in um, how well the scan is tolerated and it stops the legs from going shaky.
and then very slowly insert the probe with plenty of lubricant and say, you know, I'll stop if you want me to stop, I'll stop straight away. Um, and then you do the scan systematically. During the scan, I watch the screen all the time and occasionally I'll look at the patient's face. Um, I do the systematic scan and then at the end, I gently assess for mobility and tenderness because if you do that too soon, then sometimes people can't tolerate the scan any further. Um, I take representative views, of course, as annotated stills and video clips. I also point out to the patient right at the beginning that I'm not good at talking while I scan. I just can't do it. So it's not like it's such an, you know, a, a bad diagnosis that I, I can't uh, tell them. They know from the beginning I'm not going to be talking. Uh, so there, most people are absolutely fine with that. And then I do the scan slowly and gently. Image optimization. <laughs> I'm not going to talk to you about this because I know you know much more about this than I do. But these are all the different features that uh, I would regularly change. So a systematic scan, um, we start at looking at the introitus and the bladder, uterus and cervix, the endometrium, the ovaries and the pouch of Douglas for free fluid and the sliding sign, which should now be part of a routine scan. Um, then mobility and tenderness, and if you're more advanced, also looking at the posterior compartment. So the views that you get, if you start by just placing your probe on the introitus, this is a transvaginal probe, you place the probe on the perineum and orientate yourself. So you'll see urethra, vagina and uh, anal canal. Then very, very slowly insert the transvaginal probe uh, and follow the urethra uh, to the bladder all the time saying to the patient, let your knees go floppy. So this is the view you'd get. So you might uh, see transvaginal tape here, but you might see diverticuli. You can look at the urethra, you can look at the bladder to see how well it's emptied if there's a post void residual. Um, and this is a little video clip of me inserting the probe. So there the probe is going into the vagina with the anterior wall here and the posterior wall here, bladder, I'm going down the vagina, there's cervix and there's uterus and the endometrial cavity. So very, very slowly and gently. And what can you see when you get there? Well, you can see the urethra, the bladder, and then the lower ureters where they insert into the bladder. You can visualize those here and there's a bit of uterus uh, at the front there. So if I now in the longitudinal plane go from side to side, then you'll see that's that ureter opening into the bladder. I'm crossing the trigone in the longitudinal plane, coming out the other side, and there's the other lower ureter will appear just there. So these are things that I routinely look at, um, and they are just part of a, of a routine scan. You know that a uh, structure is the ureter. If you can see vermiculation, um, this is completely normal, of course, and distinguishes it from a blood vessel. If you go in the transverse plane, which I like to do quite a lot, um, here you can see the urethrovesical junctions, one here, one there, and you can see that this patient was uh, very well hydrated. So then, having looked at the bladder, we look at the uterus next. Um, so the things we need to think about is the position, shape, and if there's any pathology. So thinking about the position um, with the patient in the longitudinal plane like that, um, this uterus is antiverted. This uterus is retroverted where the fundus of the uterus is pointing toward the feet. Importantly, this one is antiverted and retroflexed, very important in endometriosis, and this uterus is axial. Important to know what an antiverted and retroflexed uterus looks like because this is being pulled backwards by adhesions. Um, this is a, a very common sign in endometriosis and easy to pick up if you're looking for it. So we've got the uterus in the longitudinal plane. We're going to scan from cornu to cornu uh, looking at the myometrium. So you can see that I'm, I've got a bit of cavity there and I'm going from one side to the other looking at the myometrium, looking for adenomyosis, looking for fibroids, um, also looking for, for shape, but we'll do that more in a minute. Um, 
and do that systematically from side to side. Then you can measure your uterus once you know where the contours are. Um, and I measure from fundus to where it breaks in a straight line, where it flexes. And then I take a second measurement for that. You always include the cervix in your measurements. You add those two up. And then at right angles, do um, a depth measurement. So then when we're in the, um, we're going to go transverse now onto the uterus and then um, look from cervix to fundus and back again. So from cervix we're going up to fundus, there's the interstitial portion of the fallopian tube. Um, and there it is on the other side. So we're going from fundus down to cervix now, looking at the endometrial cavity, looking to make sure that it's regular, that the cavity remains one cavity near the fundus uh, to determine the uterine shape. Once you know your contours and your widest part, you can measure the uterus from side to side. That's a width measurement um, at its widest part. Next, I'm going to look at the cervix. Uh, always important to look at carefully. You'll always see a little faint white line there. That's more or less where the bladder attaches. Go back, that's the internal cervical os. So this is the cervical canal. There's the external os, and you've got the vagina tucking in behind where it attaches to the back of the cervix. So you've got the, um, the, the canal and you've got the stroma. So different things to look at, but I always measure the length. Um, and then I put color Doppler on because you could be very surprised. You might see a feeder vessel to um, a polyp or you might see a malignancy that wasn't instantly obvious uh, any other way. And then I go in the longitudinal plane from side to side as though it was the uterus uh, to make sure that all of the cervix looks normal. And here you can see the posterior vaginal fornix. That's where the um, vagina attaches to the back of the cervix. And you can see the TV probe is in the anterior fornix. I've got the external os here, the internal os there. And you can see that where the fornix attaches to the back of the cervix, there's more cervix above it. So this is the intravaginal cervix and this is the supravaginal cervix. So I'm going to go side to side, demonstrating that posterior vaginal fornix nicely as well. There's a bit of discharge in there. Um, and you can see this is a completely normal looking cervix. Then I usually take a quick 3D. Um, a lot of TV probes have this on now. It takes almost no time at all. You render that and then you've got a coronal view of the fundus, the right side, the left side, and a lovely triangular endometrial cavity. It's quite white because this endometrium was in the luteal phase, which is the best phase to be looking for congenital uterine anomalies. Having done the uterus, we're now going to look at the endometrium in the longitudinal plane from side to side. So I'll play this video clip looking just at the endometrium. We've already looked at the myometrium, so endometrium now. Again, look, going from side to side, really examining the whole cavity, uh, looking to make sure that it's regular, that the uterine shape's normal, that there are no polyps, uh, malignancy, fluid, uh, adhesions, uh, you name it. And then you can measure the endometrium with an endometrial thickness measurement from outer to outer near the fundus or wherever it is thicker. So let's say you've got a big polyp here and it is actually thicker here, then you'd measure it at its thickest part. If it all looks pretty normal, you measure it at its thickest part near the fundus. You also comment on what phase of the menstrual cycle the endometrium's in, whether it's postmenstrual, follicular or luteal, and if you can see any abnormalities. Now, how to look for the ovaries? There's two ways of doing it. You can find them in the longitudinal plane or the transverse plane. So this, this way, we're going to look in the longitudinal plane. With the tip of the probe, we're going to mentally aim for the uterine fundus as a level. Then keep your elbow still and move the probe laterally to the internal iliac vessels. So I'm just going to play this video clip. That's the uterus I'm moving out laterally. Um, and there are my vessels, the internal iliac vessels, and there is the ovary. I'll just do that again. Level with the uterine fundus, move your probe laterally, aim for the iliacs, and there is your ovary. So it's a, quite a simple way of finding ovaries. You've got your landmarks of the internal iliac vein and the artery, um, and these tend to be relatively easy to find. If you can't find them that way, then I go transversely. Again, I'm sticking to the uterine fundus. I'm going to go transverse at that level, and then I'm gonna follow out laterally the ovarian ligament. So I'm going to, 
in a minute rotate my probe at the level of the fundus, uh, angle up past the interstitial portion of the tube to the ovarian ligament. It looks like a tube, but it isn't. It's a ligament. You follow that out laterally until, boom, there's the ovary at the end of the ligament. I'll just play that again. Rotate to transverse at the uterine fundus. Find that ligament. Move your probe. Keep it in the transverse orientation and out laterally toward the ovary. Now, it can be slightly harder to do this because your landmarks are different. There's the internal iliac vein. You can't often see the artery, so it's a little bit more tricky, but some people find this easier. The best thing is if you know both techniques and if you can't find the ovary one way, you've got another way of doing it. When you've found the ovary, you then need to rotate on the ovary till you find the longest length. At that point, you split your screen and you have your longest length then you have your depth at right angles to that, and then you rotate your probe 90 degrees anti-clockwise and you've got your width measurement. You also comment on where the ovary is, uh, if there are adhesions, what size the ovary is, um, if there's any ovarian activity, if there are follicles, how many, if there's a cyst, a mass, uh, etc. So this follicle, you would you'd count the follicles, measure the largest follicle or follicles, maybe do a follicle count and put color Doppler on looking for peripheral vascularity uh, of this follicle because it could be a, a corpus luteum. And then you look between the ovary and the uterine edge. You look in this area looking for things like a tubal abnormality. Then you go to the other side and you repeat all that. So you've got the right ovary here with a length, a depth, and a width measurement. I usually split the screen because it's nice and convenient. And then you look again at the area between the ovary and the uterus, uh, looking to see uh, if there are adhesions or any pathology. Either now or at the end, I tend to do it at the end, you judge ovarian mobility. And the easiest way to do this is with your probe. You just press very, very gently. Usually patients don't even notice you doing it. If there is a lot of bowel in the way, you might place your left hand on the abdomen, obviously telling them you're going to do this. Press gently and then again, balot with your TV probe. And this ovary is very mobile. They're not usually this obliging. I usually do this at the end of the scan because then I can go around the whole pelvis judging mobility and tenderness one bit at a time. But once I already know the anatomy. Sometimes you see a bit of fallopian tube. So in this case, this is uh, one of the adnexa. Um, there's free fluid there. It's hemorrhagic free fluid. It's probably ovulated. There's the ovary. There is the fimbrial end of the uh, fallopian tube. The fingers, if you like, fallopian tube. I'm rotating on that to get a longitudinal view uh, of that tube. And then we go to the pouch of Douglas. Um, in an antiverted uterus, this is the pouch of Douglas. In a retroverted uterus, again, the, the fundus toward the patient's feet, there is the pouch of Douglas. So the torus is there and the torus is there. So if there's any fluid, you measure the maximum depth of it um, and uh, that would be there and there. And you also need to look for uh, this nice normal uh, peritoneal reflection just here. When you see that, the pelvis cannot be frozen. When you see nice fluid here, then you know that uh, the pelvis isn't frozen, that there is at least going to be some mobility at the torus. So it's really nice to find some fluid there. Um, and you can then also assess mobility, mobility of the uterus against all the tissues behind, called the sliding sign. And that should now be a part of every routine pelvic ultrasound. Um, the findings were published 10 years ago now, and it is a very simple technique. Once you've done a few, um, you absolutely get the hang of it. The, we're looking for mobility between the uterus and the tissues behind the uterus. So where you put your probe matters. If in an antiverted uterus, you put your probe in the anterior fornix, then you can see the cervix uh, and you can judge mobility of the uterus against the bowel. If you put your probe in the posterior fornix, then you can't see the cervix. Judging mobility here is much harder, but you can see the bowel really clearly. You can see nodules and adhesions. So it's a great place to put a probe, but not for the sliding sign. So 
in a retroverted uterus, if you have your probe here in the anterior fornix, then you can see the cervix, um, but very difficult to judge mobility here. But your probe in the posterior fornix, you can then judge mobility here um, and also bowel nodules and adhesions. So I'll show you some examples. Um, this is a normal sliding sign of an antiverted uterus where the probe is in the anterior fornix. So it's an antiverted uterus, the bladder will be here, patient's head is here. I'm very gently pressing with my probe. You can see that the movement between the uterus and the bowel is very, very easy. The movement is in opposite directions, and I think that's a really nice thing to look for, it makes it simpler, in opposite directions. The movement of this probe is so gentle, mostly patients don't even notice you doing it. Be very gentle and slow. This is an abnormal sliding sign of an antiverted uterus. You can see that with me pressing very gently here, uh, you usually don't need to use your other hand to blot at all. It's just done with the probe. You can see that there's movement, but everything is glued together. So this is in fact a frozen pelvis. Then in a retroverted uterus, when you pull the probe out slightly, you often get to see a pocket of fluid if it's there. And again, just very, very gently press and you can see beautiful free mobility between the back of the uterus and the bowel. Compare that to this, which is an abnormal sliding sign. Everything's glued together. The, the posterior uterine wall is, a, is uh, adherent to everything behind, including bowel. Um, this is a frozen pelvis. And then for more advanced ultrasound, we look to the posterior compartment. We're going to look at the torus, uterosacral ligaments, rectal muscularis, and the posterior vaginal fornix. So at laparoscopy, you look through the umbilicus toward the patient's feet. So this is her left and this is her right. It's all the other way around from ultrasound. And what you can see here is the back of the uterus. Um, you can see the, uh, the right ovary, you can see the left ovary with the tubes draped over. This is the back of the uterus. This is the pouch of Douglas. This is the bowel, the rectum. Um, and then we need to look at this area here. This area here is called the torus. Now, again, just to say on ultrasound, we orientate that way, laparoscopy this way. So everything's the other way around. But this is the torus, and this is where the uterosacral ligaments attach. And these ligaments uh, attach and they are the, at the level of the torus, um, which is the same level as the internal cervical os. Um, they're part of the suspensory ligaments of the uterus. And this is a very, very common place for endometriosis. So important to be able to find it. So how do you do that on ultrasound? Longitudinal view of the internal os. Again, line it up with that, that bit of whiteness there. Internal os, the torus is here. And if I then rotate to the transverse plane, you can see the, the uh, uterosacral ligaments where they insert. So I'm just going to uh, start this video. I just go side to side to make sure I'm at the right level. Now I'm going to go transverse. So the internal os is there, the torus is here. This fine white line is the uterosacral ligament and the same on the other side. So normal ligaments are very difficult to see, but abnormal ligaments are very easy to see. So again, there's the torus and the transverse view at the level of the internal os, normal uterosacral ligaments, both sides with nice free mobility of, of bowel and everything to the uterus. So this is the, the torus and the uterosacral ligaments. Now there's another way of uh, looking at the uterosacral ligaments. Your probe is in the vagina, so it is just um, in front of this layer here because that's toward the patient's feet. You can see if I angle to the side and press gently, I'll be stretching the uterosacral ligaments over the tip of my probe. So that's what this is going to demonstrate. Um, this is the posterior fornix, a retroverted uterus. Um, the probe is here. The dark layer is the vagina. This white layer is the serosa got some free fluid. I'm in the in the center here longitudinally. I'm going to angle out to the sides. That's going to make a uterosacral ligament appear. When I then press my probe in slightly more, I'm going to apply that ligament to my probe. So there's the probe and here I'm going out to the side. That's the ligament and I'm pressing very gently and it's now applied to the tip of my probe. So that's a really good way of examining the ligaments and making sure that there's no endometriosis in them. 
Um, so that's vagina, that was the peritoneum, uterosacral ligament, and then when I pressed slightly harder, the uterosacral ligament was uh, applied to the tip of the probe. So we've done the torus and the uterosacral ligament. Next, we need to look for bowel nodules and adhesions. So for this, the probe needs to go into the posterior fornix so that we can be closer to bowel um, and uh, see, look for pathology. So how do you move your probe from the anterior to the posterior fornix? You withdraw it slightly and then you um, angle it backwards toward the sacrum. So I'm going to withdraw it slightly, angle the probe backwards to the sacrum and just you can watch as you insert the probe into that little pocket, the posterior vaginal fornix. A little bit of free fluid. Um, and then you'll see in a minute I'm going to withdraw the probe again there's that lovely peritoneal reflection in the pouch of Douglas and there I am in the uh, anterior fornix again. Most people don't notice you doing this. So I'll just do that again, withdraw the probe a little bit, angle it backwards and just very gently tuck it into the posterior fornix. You might need to say again, let your knees go floppy because um, it uh, makes it much more comfortable for, for people to have this. If you're gentle, this is not a painful examination. And here we go, taking it out of the fornix again, back into the anterior fornix. So what can you see when you get into the posterior fornix? People sometimes worry a bit like, I don't know where I am, where are my landmarks? Well, your landmarks, you've just pushed past them. So your landmarks are there, but they just tucked out of view. So here you can see, again, you can see the, the vagina and the, the peritoneum, some free fluid, and then this is bowel and with free fluid it's easier of course but you can see all the bowel layers really nicely on transvaginal ultrasound the white layer is the serosa then you get a triple layer of dark white dark and the, that's the muscularis layer very important layer so the outer longitudinal muscle fibers a little bit of connective tissue and then the inner circular muscle fibers and they of course are responsible for peristalsis then here you've got submucosa and mucosa together and submucosa and mucosa on the other side. Then you've got the posterior muscularis and posterior serosa. These are always normal in endometriosis. It's, it's this layer that's abnormal. There's your anterior wall, posterior wall and lumen. Um, it's so important to learn about the muscularis because if people with endometriosis get bowel nodules, it's that layer that's affected and it looks like this. Normal muscularis going in, a bowel nodule of very disrupted muscularis and normal muscularis going out. So how to work out if there's a bowel nodule? You can track the rectal muscularis layer and if you do this in every normal patient for a while you get really good at it and then when you really need it for endometriosis you're super good at it. So I've withdrawn the probe very slightly to get just below the cervix and there you can see the white serosa and you can see the triple layer there, the muscularis. And I'm going to keep my eye on this muscularis layer as I insert the probe. So I'm going to track it and you'll be able to follow that dark layer all the way around. Take some practice and in some people it's not so easy, but often you'll be able to track that layer out toward the uterine fundus and you'll be able to say if it's normal or not. So I'll just let it play um, again. The dark triple layer is what you're following with your eye. And there we go through the second rectal curve and follow that triple layer. The little bit of fibrous tissue makes it stand out and you can then track it round to the uterine fundus and make sure that there's no nodules of deep endometriosis. So what does a nodule look like? Well, this is one. So you've got normal muscularis going into it. There is the bowel nodule and normal muscularis going out of it. So easy to see once you're looking in the right place, i.e. the posterior compartment, which is not where people normally scan, but it's so important. Um, and you can see that you can diagnose a bowel nodule really very easily. The other thing you'll notice here is all this white tissue. This is retrocervical fibrosis and thick uterosacral ligaments, depending on which angle you're at. And then these hypoechoic nodules are deposits of deep endometriosis, which can be really painful. And then we've got normal posterior vaginal fornix uh, overlying it. So I thought I'd do you a quick as live scan demonstrating why for women with endometriosis, knowing how to do this matters so much. 
This patient was 39. Uh, she presented with severe dysmenorrhea, menorrhagia with flooding, terrible constipation, particularly during a period, no children, no surgery, a normal CTKUB and a raised C125. So she was in fact referred to the pelvic mass clinic. The minute I inserted the probe, I felt resistance uh, and diagnosed a frozen pelvis. Literally within seconds, you can see that there's no movement behind the uterus there. I'll play that again. There's no movement. Everything is glued to the back of the uterus. Then we need to do the systematic scan, uh, looking at the uterus, including the cervix, measuring uh, the length, the depth, the width, um, looking at the cervix, uh, looking at the echo texture uh, of the uterus. Uh, I've seen a little, a little area here. This is a superficial adenomyoma. There is adenomyosis here with an indistinct endometrial, uh, endomyometrial junction, some little myometrial cysts. It's not so obvious in these pictures. This is not a fibroid, but an adenomyoma because it's got translational vascularity. Um, having done the uterus and normal shape, we look at the endometrium. She was day six, so nice and thin. You can follow it all the way through the cervix. Looking at the ovaries in turn, that's the right ovary with a, a little cyst. Uh, the left ovary with a little cyst, they're probably anechoic endometriomas. They were low, but not kissing. Um, and in the transverse plane, which I love, particularly for endometriosis, this is the level of the torus. You can see both ovaries are low, but they're not kissing. They're kissing when they're in directly adherent to each other uh, as well behind the uterus. So if you put that together, scanning from side to side in the longitudinal plane, we've got this slightly bulky adenomyotic uterus with a, an anterior uh, adenomyoma just there. Um, we can see the ovarian cysts, one on one side uh, and one on the other side. Let's play that again. That's one ovarian cyst, there's the uterus, there's the other ovarian cyst. Um, and I wonder if you've uh, maybe noticed something else in this scan. You sometimes have to scan several times from side to side at different levels to see the different pathology. She had a bowel nodule. Uh, you can see here this hypoechoic bowel nodule. Um, this is the posterior muscularis. This is the anterior, so you can see it's grossly abnormal. Um, you measure it by going, measuring around the length. The depth is purely the endometriosis in the muscularis. Don't measure anything next to it. And then a width measurement of the nodule and the width of the bowel. So you can say whether it's the same width as the bowel uh, or not. And those are all indistinct um, markers of stenosis. You can say the level of it. There is that um, fibrous tissue, internal os torus. The bowel below the torus is lower rectum. Above is upper rectum in this terminology. Um, and the angle is more than 90 degrees. So these are all things you can say. There's some submucosal involvement. Um, and so we can say that uh, measuring the diameter um, past the nodule uh, compared to above it, um, this is very likely to be a stenosing lesion. You can measure the distance to the anal verge. Um, this is where I use an extended view. You can The nodule is here because it was relatively high and you can measure the distance to the first anal curve and then uh, add a couple of centimetres for, for uh, the uh, anal canal. And because this isn't such a great picture, I've shown you a different case with a, a very much lower nodule at, at, at uh, 83 millimetres, um, which was really just at the second rectal curve. And you can see that you can measure the distance and be able to um, predict a degree of difficulty or not for um, surgery. So this is a longitudinal little video clip of that bowel nodule. Um, and again, you can see more than one thing in this clip. We've got um, uterus uh, at the front, um, uterus there. Here is the bowel nodule. And then also below that level, you can see a lot of fibrous tissue. That's retrocervical fibrosis. And within that are nodules of deep endometriosis. So there you can see um, just below the bowel nodule, this is deep endometriosis at the torus and going into the uterosacral ligaments um, in the transverse plane. And you can also say whether the vagina is normal or not. So then in overview, you've got um, bilateral ovarian cysts that are uh, low and adherent uh, to, to the uterus and the pelvis. They're not kissing. You can see a bowel nodule, and then you get to see this retrocervical fibrosis with deep endometriosis. 
So with endometriosis, it's very much a case of where you're looking. Um, this is not part of a, a standard normal routine scan, but I would say if you are going to scan a patient with pelvic pain, you really need to look. The sliding sign is a very bare minimum, and the more you do this, the faster you'll help people be diagnosed with endometriosis, and currently the um, the diagnostic delay is eight years from symptoms to diagnosis, and it's because when we scan, we don't look in the posterior compartment. And if, even if you just did this, it's a frozen pelvis, uh, and that would be enough to get somebody referred to gynecology. Don't forget the bladder, of course. I do this at the end because we've started with an empty bladder and by the end of the scan, there's often some urine in the bladder. And I judge mobility and you can see that that bladder is adherent to that little nodule of adenomyosis. Um, and when I looked more carefully, I actually found a nodule of deep endometriosis uh, in that fibrotic tissue as well. Important information for the surgeon. And at the end of all that, I draw a cartoon uh, for myself so I can uh, remember how to write the report nicely, but also patients find this really, really useful. So there was that deep endometriosis between the bladder and the adenomyotic nodule. Um, there was the deep endometriosis at the torus going into the uterosacral ligaments. There was a, a low ovary uh, with a small cyst and one on the other side. There is the bowel nodule. All of this stuff is adhering to each other as a frozen pelvis. And then in the coronal plane, I say that these ovaries have become pulled down to the level of the torus by the endometriotic process, deep endo there, frozen pelvis there. The important thing to realize is that if you do a laparoscopy, you can only see so far because you can't see below this level. So you can't see whether there's a bowel nodule and you can't predict whether you're going to need a bowel surgeon um, for any excisional um, treatment. And to make that point, this is a different case, uh, patient, but you can see this is a frozen pelvis laparoscopy with the back of the uterus. There's the pouch of Douglas. The ovaries are all glued down to the uterus and you would not be able to see a bowel nodule, but you can on ultrasound. So in my report, um, I would say uh, all the things that we've been uh, talking about in great detail, um, and this is very useful for planning surgery. So I would say transvaginal gynae ultrasound is really excellent. Um, start TV in most of the patients with an empty bladder. You will give yourself an extra 10 minutes for the TV component of the scan. And um, so few people need a transabdominal scan that uh, I think this is, this is how we do it anyway. Uh, always stick to a systematic approach and uh, stay curious. There are a lot of step-by-step -step videos on my website and if you'd like to contact me, um, please feel absolutely free. Thank you.